Ya. Ben Kafir <gülüyor> senin bu arada sana bir. Welcome to the young, our first Young Scholars uh, Seminar of 2024. I'm Mariam Kuchuk. I work at the Unisemer Institute London, Turkey's Cultural Diplomacy Centre in the UK. And it's named after Unisemer, uh, the famous 14th century poet. Having opened its doors in 2010, it aims to promote the history, culture and language of Turkey. The Young Scholars Seminar Series is part of this effort. Taking place since 2017, This seminar series is an international and interdisciplinary platform for outstanding postgraduate students to present their research to the wider public. Tukay Durak is one of those students. He is a PhD candidate and teaching assistant at UCL's Faculty of Education and Society in London. His research dives into higher education, the movement of students and teachers, the global connections this movement fosters, and the shifting academic landscape. I've had the pleasure of moderating Tugay before, two years ago, but this was right at the start of his PhD, so I'm very excited to see how this PhD has developed and very excited to see what new findings he has uncovered. So, without further ado, I pass over to Tugay. Great, thank you. Thank you for having me here again, and hi everybody. Just, it might be easier here. And again, I, was, I guess I was the first one again for the 2022, or more or less exactly two years before, the after the pandemic it uh, it has been yeah it was kind of incredible journey i would say <laughs> so uh being here after two years again it is a privilege thanks for having me here i do remember at the time it was nearly finished i had the COVID, and then i felt better for a couple of days and came here gave, gave the presentation uh, it was quite early days for me while to be able to talk about the finding some of the things but in my PhD, now I'm almost, more or less, I would say, inshallah, soon to be completed. Uh, now, somehow addressing the final drafts. Therefore, I can freely and easily to be talk about all those findings. But also in my PhD, I dealt into quite different aspects of the academic diaspora project. And while at that time, I talk about experiences of Turkish academics. And also, I looked at the motivations and the, all the dynamics and structures shaping the academic migration from Turkey to the UK. And also, this is the, the, the one aspect of it, their diasporic engagements quite specifically. Uh, today I'm going to talk about their diasporic engagements, how and why they engage in diasporic engagements, and also in what ways they do feel that they support development of Turkey, how they support each other, and why these contributions are so limited, what can we do to uh, enhance those kind of activities. These are the things which I would like to talk about today. This evening, I would say. <coughs> um, firstly, uh, as you know, that the Turkish migrants in, in the world, there are nearly more than actually uh, 6 million Turkish diaspora in 
the world, I would say, and half of them living in Germany or other continental European countries. And United States has been always the most popular study and work destination for academics and students. And but quite recently, in the recent years, UK is gaining so much popularity for the labor migrants and the students and academics as well. And you will see some statistics for that as for that aspect. So if you look at here, again, it changed. Uh, actually, I should have maybe updated quite recently, <laughs> but still because quite recently the new data released, um, Germany still is became the most popular study destination for the Turkish students, and US is no longer is a top study destination for the Turkish students. After the pandemic, there is some kind of recovery process, and for example, the number of Chinese students again became. Um, came to the pre-pandemic situation, but still uh, Turkish students, I shouldn't say no longer, but still the numbers are decreasing for the US. Instead, Germany became much, much more popular and popular, and UK is gaining so much popularity, especially for the undergrad level. Um, the number of master and PhD students somehow quite similar over the years, but the number of undergrad students choosing to UK to study is constantly increasing in the last years and still keeping that pace, I would say. That's an interesting uh, to say that. Because in the past, uh, it wasn't much more conventional for the Turkish students to choose abroad to study for the bachelor level. Now it's a bit uh, changing. It is uh, important to say that. And again, uh, for the US, the numbers, uh, as you, uh, you saw that in the UK, there's a constant increase, but for the US, it's somehow quite fluctuating. And now, uh, before the pandemic, it decreased nearly 10,000, but now, as far as I know, nearly 10,000, something like that. And so, it's a somehow much more downward um, trendy, I would say for the US, especially after the 9-11, Turkish students also were among the groups who were affected the things against Islamophobia and everything. It's changed a little bit. Again, in those processes, the other destinations, including UK, Germany, became much more popular. And when we come to the UK, UK is most probably the most international academia in the world. There are more than 200,000 uh, academics, academic workers working here in the UK, and nearly one third of them are international, which means that more than 70,000 of them are international, which makes UK is the biggest international, uh, the home for international academia. For example, in the in United States, less than five percent only are internationals. Although United States is the immigration country, but for the international academics, it is a bit different. In the UK, it is much more higher in terms of the proportionality, I would say. Um, all, more or less half of them come from Europe, half of them come from non-European countries. And again, this is the trend most probably will change the other way, non-European countries because of the Brexit consequences, um, unfortunately for the UK. <laughs> so again, when we look at here for the Turkish academics numbers here in the UK, again, you see there is an increasing trend for the Turkish academics to choose to come to the UK as working as academic staff, which means that they do have a PhD to work here as an academic staff. So this is sort of, um, I cannot say this is a concerning situation because some of the things which I will tell you that uh, I do see it is a positive thing uh, for the Turkey or the international community and then we will talk about it, the, how it can be a positive thing for, the Turkey, for Turkey as well. So, but still, you see that there's an most, not experiential, I will say, but we will need more data. <laughs> we have engineers here, I'm sure they know how it's gonna go up, but I don't expect it's gonna be even all the time go up, because also to be able to, an academic in the UK, you need to have solid academic papers, procedures, PhDs, and everything. So. It's going to go up for a, bit, for a while, I assume that, but not all the time. So, 
we know that there are so many benefits comes from while being an international academic mobile I would say being a mobile academic in the world and for example career and capital accommodation I would say better salaries working at prestigious institutions I always say that working in the UK as a Turkish academic it could be quite career enhancing activity and this is one of the best higher education sectors here uh, in the world I would say and therefore th these are the, some of the main reasons why they choose to work here in the UK um, so quite understandable but also if you look at the source countries there are a couple of reasons why there is not much literature on in mobility of academics and many people say that because people don't want to talk about it the reason is that because it is in most cases they are talking about it brain drain <coughs> so especially for the academics um, so that is the, the sad reality I would assume so but also quite recently some people were thinking that but there are some ways to overcome such challenges I mean the brain drain challenges I would say and also to be able to get some benefit from those who migrated to overseas countries in the UK as well and for example because there are some stu studies now uh, to focusing on how these diasporic academics somehow help the home country development and working um, playing a role as knowledge brokers between two countries and even in some cases uh, they can play a huge role in political situations as well at the same time quite not funnily quite interesting fact is that for example Einstein played a huge role in recognition of Israel for example you may think as an example of that in United Nations he gave in a speech uh, to recognize Israel so therefore migrant academics can play a huge roles for their countries in many ways I would say <coughs> and but also again quite interestingly there is limited focus on internationalization of higher education between the diaspora academics when I looked at the findings I saw some clear evidence that is quite linked between the internationalization and diaspora academics and also even the higher education studies again there is not much focus on that so I looked at quite specifically uh, what kind of roles the Turkish academics play in this context and I will share those things I did 50 uh, interviews with the Turkish academics tends the online nature of it <laughs> they were all around in the UK they were working more than 30 different institutions there was someone from Aberdeen someone from Northern Ireland all around the UK therefore there was a quite huge diversity and also in terms of the discipline in terms of the um, age and everything so there was a huge uh, diversity I would say <coughs> I really like it that kind of diversity again these are uh, some extra uh, information demographic information for the participants and even I collected some data and where they studied in, the, in Turkey and also how in which countries they have received their PhDs as well and most half of them studied in the UK for their PhDs and then became an academic here and some of them studied in the in US and Canada and some did their PhDs in Turkey so I use transnationalism in which case we also think that these migrant people has more than one identity while living here they do have some belonging to the UK they develop over the years but also they do have some feeling of attachment to Turkey as well uh, so I just use that conceptual understanding so here are the things a couple of things they engage in as a diasporic activity I would say for example in most cases uh, the common contribution I would say they do they feel that they do for um, for favor of Turkey I would say <laughs> to be honest hosting the Turkish academics for example they became a huge role to be able to host the Turkish people from Turkey I would say um, they somehow became the first contact <laughs> because whenever a tur Turkish person, Turkish academic in Turkey, if they want to have a semester or a year in the UK, in most cases, the first contact are the Turkish academics working in the UK. So therefore, there's a kind of quite good links between them. 
Uh, for example, this person told me that I was the director of the research center at the university where I worked during the 10 or 15 years. I hosted approximately 7 to uh, 80 Turkish visiting scholars. They came as visiting researchers, they work with me, they work on their independent projects. This is the, the, the most common contribution they felt that they are doing. The other one, kind of quite interesting because in most, some of them quite visible on social media or some conferences, therefore they are known people in Turkey. Especially in the least um, newly established universities, I would say, the, the least prestigious universities, the students somehow reach those people, asking their advice all the time. Some, <laughs> they told me that some of the questions were so silly, <laughs> But still, I do my best to answer those questions. For example, how can I find a job in the UK? For example, that kind of <laughs> Or, I, I don't know, how can I find a scholarship, etc. But there are much more genuine questions. For example, now I'm considering to apply, for example, this university, and you are working there, could you give me some advice? There are much more genuine questions, and then they, all of them trying to answer those questions, and they felt that Many of them told, uh, told me that they feel some kind of responsibility to be able to respond to those questions because they feel that uh, unfortunately Turkish students are not much confident while contacting not non-Turkish academics. So they feel that okay we have to answer those questions if they are genuine. That is the somehow distinction. But they told me that we're gonna, I'm doing my best to be able to answer those questions and sometimes giving feedback, their papers, their, they are reading their proposals. These are the things, in most cases, they do that. Especially the ones, again, the students working at, uh, studying at this, what we call Anatolian universities, but much more newly established universities because they don't have much people around them to be able to ask those questions. And so these are the things in most cases they do offer early career researchers and students from Turkey, but also they do genuinely engage in transnational partnerships. Because especially in the UK, I haven't felt this is the case for the US or other European countries, but in the UK, international partnerships are quite key in academic work and academic world, I would say. Therefore, the academics are, engaged, uh, are encouraged to engage in transnational partnerships. There are so many funding opportunities for UK-based ac academics to be able to construct some uh, international partnerships. In these cases, quite frankly, I would say, the UK-based Turkish academics purposefully choose Turkey-based academics as international partners. That was quite interesting finding, I would say. And especially because there are some, even there are some OEDE, uh, Organization of Development Countries, but now UK changed the development plans, but again now they're going to initiate some of the things as well. But uh, here the Turkish academics, if they are aware of that kind of specific programs who are encouraging to work with the developing countries, and if Turkey is one part of it, especially there was a Nifton Katip Çelebi Fund, maybe you know that one, that was quite key developing that kind of transnational partnerships because if because that is well paid, prestigious and overcoming all structural barriers. Therefore, these academics actively engaging uh, British Academy uh, and uh, Nifting Katip Çelebi uh, fellowships, not fellowships, research funds as well. I do hope that UK still consider Turkey as a partner. <laughs> but also I argued that Turkish academics here, taking those monies to be able to collaborate with Turk Turkey-based academics, they play a huge role. Because they know the country, they know the problems, they know how to tackle those problems, they have the expertise, they have the enthusiasm, they have everything to be able to use those funds effectively, and they do that. Therefore, I always argue that UK should be able to understand how uh, these uh, diaspora academics can play a huge role actively and effectively using those funds. Um, so, for example, this person told me that I did four projects with the Turkish partners funded by British Academy, ARC, Mercury, etc. And thanks to these funds, 
we hire students and researchers. I also think that it has the, uh, a vision to the Turkish University and to the people we work with them. So in, also in most cases, this kind of be uh, co-partnerships, co co-authorships in international uh, writers, writerships, I would say. And in most cases also, they, they feel that uh, knowledge spillover is part of those projects. And you have to think about how your projects can benefit Turkey, for example, in this case. They genuinely feel that I have to do it quite good to be able to somehow contribute to Turkey. This is why they are engaging those kind of projects. For example, there are a couple of projects working, for example, Colombia or other countries as Latin American or African countries, but they are not feeling that kind of affection, I will say, to be able to contribute to the development of Africa. They are not feeling the same things for those countries, but they are feeling those th things for Turkey. That was quite nice to hear that. <laughs> Um, so, but also there are some sad stories as well I would like to share with you. For example, this person, I shouldn't say the name, <laughs> Ali, let's say Ali, Ali, Ali Oja. <laughs> um, he, he left Turkey for quite, I would say, political reasons, unfortunately. And then the university made some pressures and then he, he somehow he tried to work there as much as he can, but then eventually he quit. He had to, and then came to the UK as an academic. He was quite successful, and still he's willing to go back to Turkey, but not soon, I would say. But still, he felt that to be able to contribute to the scholarship on Turkey, this is kind of quite clear contribution to Turkey. They feel that to be able to con continue to contribute to the scholarship on Turkey, this is the part of my duty. They felt that. And um, so, for example, this person told me that we are working hard to understand Turkey. I consider it my, it is my responsibility to think, to write, to draw, I mean to draw, I mean research about Turkey as a political scientist. Especially social scientists feel it's a sole responsibility for them to be able to produce those critical inf knowledge about Turkey. They feel that this is their responsibility to be able to continue to work on those critical issues. But quite, again, sadly, to think about how my country can be a better place and more democratic state is my duty. Of course, this is probably seen as a treason rather than a contribution for, by those in power or whatever. I think I contributed to the better understanding of those issues. I didn't like it. And that person, I felt that is one of the ones who were quite nationalistic in many sense. And, but he, he's genuinely trying to do his best to be able to contribute to Turkey as much as he can. And as a political scientist, he believes that producing those information, those knowledge, I would say, those scholarship on Turkey, it is the contribution. That is a kind of quite nice uh, way to put it. Um, I actually quite agree with this excerpts because the academic freedom issue we're going to talk about quite later sometimes can be quite critical and uh, I would say problematic <laughs> in Turkey so therefore these social scientists here in the UK they can, they can produce those knowledge much more easily and freely. Um, before concluding uh, the parts there are two concluding thoughts I would say there are quite a lot findings and, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it more uh, but there are two concluding remarks I would like to make for example the first one um, as you have seen that these people are playing a huge role in transnational partnerships these people are engaging with co-international co-authorships for as always UK proudly presents itself we are the, the biggest country for international co-authorships. I, I argue that these are the international academics actually working with their fellows, with their own countries. These are the somehow quite contribute to the international publications of UK. And also these people somehow playing a role to attracting more students and academics to the UK. Therefore, these people becoming an uh, important player here in the UK to international, internationalization of higher education. 
kind of quite easily understandable. And another thing as well, again, the set story part is that, that 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 was one of the things actually to be while talking to my academics sometimes they felt that why are these people trying to support Turkey? <laughs> so they feel that they have to criticize the government all the time. There was kind of hotly debated issues at the time. But I always quite clearly state that the Turkey, for the Turkish people, that is quite nice to, to think that they somehow, for the love of country, can be quite, I don't know, overlasting or overcoming other issues. And they are still keeping the idea of supporting the country and on behalf of the solidarity, on behalf of their own people. The belonging to Turkey is much more far beyond the current government, they feel that. So I don't like it and then just try, even I convinced my supervisor, okay, these people, they can be quite critical to the government, which is quite perfectly normal. But still, that being a Turkish is somehow quite transcendental, I will say. <laughs> so therefore, it is quite nice to differentiate these two things. And because sometimes maybe some people confuse about it. So I have written a short piece of article about that one and so where you can find much more detailed discussions about this kind of uh, findings. And so yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm going to open the floor for questions in just a moment. I just have a couple of questions myself. And as I'm the host, I get to go for that. <laughs> um, so it was fascinating what you were talking about. I mean, I'm not exactly an academic, and I was not your, like, within the methodology. I'm not, I, I grew up here. I, to, I had my undergrad here, so I'm not quite who you are interviewing. But I, too, felt, feel the need when I do my research, when I do my studies. I also do social science and history. So I want to better Turkey as well, and you did encapsulate that quite well. Like whatever I do, I always think ahead that way. But it's not only the academics wanting to do well, you highlighted how there is actual tangible good that academics can do. Um, so I guess my question becomes, does, is this recognized among policy circles? What are the current policies, initiatives, efforts around this? Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the, what Turkey, Turkey does to be able to collaborate with these people working abroad, I would say, this is kind of quite the issue. And when I started my PhD, actually, that was the idea. I do remember the first time I started my PhD, the, that was the, the key idea always for myself. There, was, there, there is an outstanding researchers program, maybe some of you heard about it, and trying to convince some of the Turkish academics working at the good prestigious universities, I would say, to come back to Turkey for a couple of years to do some research. That is the main initiative, and still I, I think they are operating the program. But I always felt that at the time, when I talked to some of the academics working here, how difficult for them to leave everything for a couple of years and then go back to Turkey. That is so difficult and not achievable. And actually, although they don't uh, officially publicize the statistics, but I felt that at the time the people who are somehow easily go back to Turkey for a couple of years, either early careers or didn't have a permanent contract here, which is the case, either somehow the late professors somehow is going to be the uh, emeritus soon. But the, therefore, this kind of physical return programs, I don't think they can attract the most um, abled academics, I will say, they, at their peak times, because it's so difficult for them uh, to go back to Turkey for a couple of times. This is the, the problem, and unfortunately, Turkey, as far as I know, there, there are some small, simple programs, but they did not, I, I don't know, um, focus all the Turkish academic diaspora in the world. Uh, to be able to engage much more purposefully, much more effectively, how we can collaborate with these people while they are there. This is the idea I always had that. We have to think about what we can do, uh, how we can collaborate with these people while they are working there. Because they have network, they have funding, they have everything. So Turkey has to do some little things to be able to collaborate with these people. Because they said, they told me that the Turkey doesn't 
don't doesn't need to do so much thing. They just need to I don't know open the some of the statistics or I don't know ask for us to come here. That these are some small requests they made it. Other than that, they have all the resources and willingness to be able to do that, but uh, they need some kind of reassurance, some kind of official uh, invitations, etc. Therefore, Turkey needs to do that because it is quite unfortunately Latin American countries, African countries, all not only the developing world, I would say, the all many European countries, Italians, um, I don't know, Spanish, they also have strong academic networks in the UK. German academic diaspora is the largest one here in the UK. They do quite collaborate effectively with the Germany. So therefore we have to do it. We, we need to do it actually. This, this, this is the idea. All right, fascinating. Um, are there any questions from the audience? If not, I do have another question. Okay, go for it. Uh, first of all, I, I very much like to thank you to Guy for the presentation because my initial idea was also uh, was also that it will be a kind of lamentation about the brain drain and stuff, but it was more positive and more <laughs> constructive. And, uh, I'm always seeing, seeing the full side. <laughs> Uh, having that academic diaspora uh, in many ways can help help the Turkey and develop the Turkish uh, Turkish academy. But I was wondering what was the main obstacle do you think to preventing uh, to make it further uh, further collaboration? Uh, because the Turkish academics, they were there are some people we can we, we see that, but uh, their percentage is not that much high. Uh, it was less than less than one person. What do you think the main obstacle for the academics or also for the students uh, to make it more or to get more uh, f further collaborations and contribute to UK and also to Turkey? Good. Thank you. Thank you for the question because I also generally think about it. Uh, the main obstacle, again, lack of official initiations. And, but also <coughs> because the academics, unfortunately, they cannot do much by themselves. They need some kind of the, the programs to be able to do it. Somebody, somebody has to do the program and they can initiate. Because in the UK, quite, I'm sure there are some academics here, uh, because of the heavy workload, <laughs> they cannot do anything <laughs> outside of their I don't know, working. They, they do a lot outside of their working hours. So to be able to think extra outside of those heavy workloads, it's near impossible. That is one thing, the heavy workloads, they always uh, talk about it because here it is so difficult for us to be able to, even uh, to be able to talk to friends, to be able to meet for friends. For academics, it's really difficult <laughs> in the UK to be able to meet the demands of academic works. Therefore, this is one thing. And also the other side, the Turkish part, again, they have different responsibilities, much more teaching based, but still, they have a teach uh, workloads quite a lot. That was the main, uh, one of the main obstacle. The other one, uh, lack of institutional support. But the other one, unfortunately, I think that is the sad one uh, because of the frictions between the groups. I mean, the, in the UK, not in, only in the UK, but all around the world, among the Turkish migrant groups, I would say, um, there are some frictions because one of them told me that I actually kind of, it was kind of common sense. They sometimes feel that they have to be, I don't know, they have to come together, but these groups can be quite easily marginalized and they don't want to be associated with those groups at the same time. So it is somehow quite difficult to combine these people on the same ground because they do have their own political perspectives, but there some groups, become much more political, I would say. And so therefore the other ones do not want to be associated with those groups. <laughs> so, and also, but if they do another one, so they also be known another thing as a, uh, for other reasons as well. So the frictions between the groups, that was one of the main things uh, to make them somehow to stay away uh, from those um, group, groupings, I would say, because there was much more university alumni groups, I would say, that was one of the, the biggest networks are actually the alumni, for example, Bozci University Alumni Network or Middle East Technical University Alumni Network. These are much more active in many sense, but even for some of them, 
they don't want to be associated too much with, with those networks as well, sometimes, not all the time, but because of the, the political agenda. So that is the, the, one of the biggest issues. Therefore, actually, I, when I talk to these people, uh, I, always, I was always thinking about what, when, what can we do about to make some connections between these people, because also there's a lack of connection between these people. And there was the common ground is that the Turkish embassy, um, the meeting under the Turkish embassy, and somehow they felt that that is a neutral area, <laughs> uh, in a good sense, because at least the most neutral area, maybe not the best, but still the most neutral area. And as you also uh, attended that one, we organized that Turkish academic diaspora event at the Turkish embassy. And that was one of the, f the first ones as, uh, created here, the residence. I do hope it will continue. That was kind of the initiating process, but these kind of events has to be much more conducted everywhere, maybe. That was the maybe one way to go forward. Thank you. <laughs> go for it. Just, just a quick one, thank you for the um, presentation. Maybe this is not actually part of your research, but I was wondering, you said there is a lack of official initiatives about this topic. And I was wondering why there is a lack of official initiatives in Turkey. Um, because if you go to these people, the people in charge, and ask them, this is important and we need to make sure that there is a collaboration, and they'll say, yes, yes, it is really important. But why it is not happening? No, what's your um, perspective on? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. But I always feel that regarding the importance of the diaspora in the world, not only for Turkey, in the world, there's there's kind of speculations because some sometimes in many not in many countries, but in some countries, I would say these. People, these migrants, I mean, the highly skilled migrants, seem deserters. I mean, that they escaped. And why do we need to see them? They are valuable. They might be the, the, behind the logic, this kind of lack of awareness, I would say, one, one way to put it. Uh, I'm sure some people think about it. And so the importance of the this kind of diaspora, I don't think they do understand. That is one way of putting that one. Also, they, 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 they may even don't like the idea <laughs> of them. <laughs> and so that might be the other one. But also this kind of things needs so much knowledge, enthusiasm, funding. This is quite a lot. And I genuinely think that there were a couple of initiatives, but they didn't last long, unfortunately. So because you need to have an agenda for it. it has to be so much for years, so it, it, it needs to be taken so much seriously, I would say, and also put some money. But uh, the other, uh, on the other hand, I will say that the Turkish academic diaspora in the world, if I say a Turkish diaspora, it's quite, quite new. Because now we are always talking about the Turkish diaspora in Germany, because they were there more than 50 years. So maybe after 20 years, we were always talking about the Turkish academic diaspora. Maybe it may change. And because of the numbers and, and everything. But, but also, the, on the other end, why they are not talking about it much? And it, it, for example, for the Turkish diaspora in Germany, when you think about it, the, the, all the political situation is also part of it. And they are somehow considered them as Turkish and much more conservative, much more homaging groups, etc. But to, to be able to deal with the academics, it's much more intricate issue, I would say. They are much more individualistic, they are much more critical for many things, because we are all academics, or we are going to be, so always to criticize everything. <laughs> These are so much issues to be tackled, I would say. So therefore, it is a difficult issue to, to, to deal with. For, for the low-skilled migrants, it's much more easier. But for a high skilled migrants to be able to initiate those kind of networks, it needs to take taken seriously, I would say. Thank you for the thought. Uh, I have a question, but it might be a bit out of topic, maybe you encounter with it. So, have you ever talked to 
talk with academics or the PhD students who studied here and go, uh, go back to Turkey, like how the technology transfer or knowledge transfer is successful in Turkey? Like, are they doing good or is it effective if they go, go back to Turkey and like continue their studies or they work, work, work as an academic there? Have you, do you have any? Do you mean their students or themselves? Themselves. Like, are they? I guess the engineers needs to the equipment. And it's like a very expensive equipment, especially medical maintenance things. So the Turkish universities, you know, needs to, like the, the, the field is like the supplements to the us, or they just ignore and then make just the, say that they just teach the students, but the what will they teach? It'd be yeah. like the needs to be supplements, equipment. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, that was the, the first part of the findings. <laughs> this is the first chapter, first empirical chapter. <laughs> Not this one, but still, that was the issue, unfortunately. Because the world now is much more periphery and center. Unfortunately, Turkey is, some people say it, we are on the line. <laughs> I always like to think that. We are always in the gray zone. Uh, not so less developed, but not so much developed, always on the gray zone. But especially intellectual, I would say. UK is one of the leading intellectual centers. Therefore, this, in the world now, these centers attract all the talents from all around the world. It is so, I argue that, actually. It is so difficult for any new country to emerge in, as a new power. Because these, uh, they call these countries as magnetics. Whenever a new talent emerges somewhere, they immediately attract that one. That is kind of how it works. So anywhere in the world, some people are so bright, so talented, UK gets it. It, it is how it's done. Therefore, for a country like Turkey, it is so difficult to develop, uh, academically I would say, intellectually. This is one way to put it. Uh, but because also it needs to get resources and everything, the structure, academia, and these are all part of the story. But again, that was the one of the things uh, when I discovered because some of them did their PhDs here and they returned back to they returned to Turkey for a couple of years. They felt that what I, I am doing here, <laughs> because I did do, I conducted those all high-end research studies over there. I had those opportunities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they moved back to the UK. That was quite common actually for many. Uh, so unfortunately, that is the case, and but it is not only for Turkey. I always like to think much more broader picture. Maybe 99% of the all universities in the world they are teaching universities. They are not doing research. If you go to India, if you go to Z Z Zimbabwe, or if you go to Latin America, or even if you go to United States, wherever you find, 99% of the universities are doing teaching only. So that is the reality. But while we are doing here PhD, <laughs> we feel that we're going to conduct high-end research. So we go to Turkey with that high expectations of life and academia. So that is going to be it likely uh, a disappointment. So I do suggest for everyone, look, that was the kind of the feeling, some of them, if they became a part of the change because some of them became part of the change and they some of them stayed in turkey as much as they can uh, and still some of them still there uh, i because some of them returned to turkey after i talked to them and they felt that because i do have my family here i have a good prestigious position here in turkey so i can do my research in turkey but the last thing i can say that these people are mature people, which means that they have a family. <laughs> they have a wife, they have a husband, they have children here. So therefore, to be able to go back to Turkey, it requires much more deliberate decision, I would say. So it is, it is so much difficult issue, going back and, and moving between the countries. It's a difficult issue when you grow older, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, I understand that um, focusing on how can we develop our democracy? Would be a good starting point to overcome this uh, all uh, obstacles. Uh, yeah, I can 
Uh, remember very well that in 2014, a researcher, a professor from New York University, uh, I think his name was Emrah Altindish, hmm. just asked one question to, to the former president. Uh, and then someone has canceled his permission, anti permission, and his, uh, I think, uh, uh, colleagues uh, constantly have received message uh, against the Amr Altanish from the Turkey. I found this example very valuable uh, to understand how uh, we are not able to uh, link or be a link with uh, Turkish or Turkey based uh, researchers or uh, students or colleagues etc etc. Uh, I think it's uh, absolute lack of democracy and freedom at the starting point. Start. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question and comment, I will say. But I always feel that there is an academic freedom and there is a freedom of speech. And freedom of speech much more broader mm -hmm. and for everyone. And academic is, freedom is much more narrower for the academics to be able to conduct the research freely. And therefore, for example, you can consider Take an example, United States. Academic freedom is much more protected than the freedom of speech. And if you, if you can do that, you can f create a safe heavens in campuses for academics and for the research and academics freedoms, and you can create the best higher education system in the world, although freedom of speech may be not the best if you consider the United States. And therefore, I always like to think that you can do, you can create heavens on campuses to be able to conduct research freely. So that may initiate innovation and then the other things will follow up. So therefore, I always, as a higher education researcher, I am again, a believer in hope. <laughs> I always feel that we can do that, we can create the first heavens, the campus heavens I would say, uh, for the academic freedom and the other things will follow the lead. So it might be the starting point and it can be easily done actually to be honest. I always feel that. I hope. The freedom of speech again much more difficult to tackle, it's much more broader much more individualistic, but academic freedom is much more easily. Just a couple of signatures can handle the issue. All right, then I'll ask a final question. Um, what next? <laughs> <laughs> For me, <laughs> first graduate. <laughs> that, that was a good thing <laughs> to think at least. Uh, so I, I always considered myself when I started this PhD having a broader impact on the policy uh, on this knowledge diaspora policies and still I am at that point after these years for five years I, and now still I'm much more thinking that I have to be somehow a person initiating this kind of um, knowledge transfer and everything because I always felt that I may not be the brightest person on the world I mean as it even as a Turkish but still I felt that I have the enthusiasm and knowledge how these things work and therefore I can make this knowledge transfer much more easily so that was the, my aim <laughs> well that sounds uh, very important and very pertinent. Uh, we've covered a couple of very interesting topics, very fascinating topics, from knowledge transfer to academic freedoms to freedom of speech, everything very, very important. And so, first